So why don't we do some demos and take a look at using PNRP at the command line so you can kind of see how this all works. Let's go ahead and explore the world of peer-to-peer -peer using our command prompt. It is just a normal command prompt and we're going to use the network services shell. So we're just going to start off by getting into the shell with netsh and let's dive right in and go into peer-to-peer -peer, PNRP and go to the cloud context. And what we're going to do is show a list. This shows all of our available clouds. So the first cloud is the global cloud and the second cloud is my link local cloud which is basically the subnet represented by the wireless adapter in my laptop. The state is virtual for both of these clouds. That's a good thing. The PNRP, PNRP infrastructure is kind of a lazy load environment, which means we don't fire everything up until you actually start to use it. So um, if we didn't see virtual here, we'd probably it would probably mean we had some kind of error situation um, if, if we were looking at this for the first time without registration. So everything looks good here. You can get more detail by saying show names. We'll actually look at this after we've registered some peer names and see a lot more detail. But here we can see you know, global virtual, my cloud operational mode, not started, auto config. These are my synchronization servers on the internet that I'll use for my global peer names um, and also use those to grab you know nearby peers and cache those and look up peers and things like that. And so uh, my link local also not started. So let's switch over to the peer context, do a show registration. And as, as we would expect, we don't have any entries right now. So let's add a registration. We can only do unsecure names in the network shell. And by default, add registration will add a peer name to all of my available clouds. If I wanted to scope to a particular cloud, I could do something like that and say, just register me in the global cloud, for example. But we'll go ahead and register um, 0.jeff. You can also register as many names as you would like. So I can put in 0.test as well and register that. And now if I show my registration, it will show me I have two different peer names registered on this machine. That's good. Let's switch back to the cloud context now. Show my list of clouds. And here, let's try that again. All right, we a little a little slow in getting the global cloud set up. Uh, the alone would have been a bad thing. Um, here you can see that we've got um, the uh, global cloud shown as active, which means, okay, we're in, we're registered. Um, I've found nearby peers, life is good. The link local shows it as a loan. And the reason why is, is I'm on my local subnet, so there's no um, server to register with. Um, and unless there's other peers, you know, doing peer-to-peer -peer on my local subnet, um, I'm pretty much alone. So that's okay to see on the link local. It would be a bad thing to see on the global. Um, so let's do a show names for more info. And so you can see a lot more information now here here available to us. So again, those are my synchronization servers. I'm a full participant. Here's the IP address and the port I'm working off of. You can see I have 22 cached entries, um, which represents basically there's things out there in the cloud that I can talk to. Um, here's my peer name. We'll talk about identities and comments and things like that later in subsequent screencasts. Um, here's zero.test with its associated information as well. And then here's my link local. I'm a full participant, but again, no synchronization servers, no cached entries. Again, if there was a another peer um, just sitting on my same subnet here, I could actually have cache entries, but we don't have that here. So that really is kind of the, the, the key way to go about registering peer names using uh, the, the NetSH environment, the network services shell. Uh, what we're going to do is open up another command window here real quickly. And what I want to do is now try and do some resolution, some resolve, some lookups against those peer names. Um, with PNRP, you cannot resolve a peer name from the same process that you've registered it. And that's why I have another command window. Now you could, for theater of the mind, pretend that you've registered in the green window and left your laptop running at home, took a spare laptop and ran up to the library or the Starbucks and fired up this command prompt there. And assuming they haven't done anything with blocking ports or doing some weird network configurations, all of this would work just the same, even if I was on a different laptop. But what we'll do is dive into our network shell again, peer to peer. P P N R P and go into the peer context and let's do a resolve zero dot Jeff. This normally takes a little bit, um, so I'll fill in the gap by telling you that in the next screencast we will actually kind of be doing similar things but using the PNRP API directly. And so obviously resolve takes a little while. Um, it, just so you know, the resolve method in the API does have an asynchronous implementation as well. So I can do an asynchronous resolve. So if I was building a client app, for example, I wouldn't want to block the, the same the thread that the GUI is running on. So I would 
it really is helpful that I can run this asynchronously. And now we've got a result. So it's found two endpoints associated with 0.jeff. One is the endpoint on the local link or the link local cloud. So that's this one represented by the address 192. And then I've got one from the global internet as well, which is this IPv6 kind of address. So that's really kind of nice. But there's one other thing that I can do, which is really powerful. I can say show converted name for 0.jeff. And what this is going to show me is a DNS name that represents that endpoint that I can actually use just like any DNS name from anywhere else on the internet with any of my applications and go and connect to that peer I'm using that DNS name. Now there's no actual DNS server involved. This is PNRP kind of black magic going on that makes this work. So what I can do is I can actually go in and say ping jeff.pnrp.net and you can see it's gone out and it's actually pinging on the internet um, that peer. Uh, so really cool. We'll do in the third screencast an example of where we use PNRP with WCF and we actually connect to uh, um, applications um, over the internet using Windows Communication Foundation and giving the WCF client um, application the DNS quote unquote DNS, the faux DNS, based on the PNRP, PNRP, P, <laughs> based on the PNRP peer resolution that I'm doing. Um, I guess that's kind of redundant, PNRP peer resolution. So let's fix that. So we actually connect those computers using the DNS name that we're, uh, we find via PNRP. So very, very kind of cool stuff. Now what I'm going to do is go back up here and show you one more little thing that can be helpful from a troubleshooting perspective, just so you know. Again, not a deep dive into troubleshooting here in this particular screencast. But I'm going to switch over to the interface Teredo context here. And Teredo is the technology that we use to map the uh, IP6 stuff and tunnel it through IP4. And I can ask it to show me its state. And this is kind of what we would like to see after we've fired up the PNRP environment. This is a list of, of information. If it's a short list, it usually it'll include an error entry and it will tell you why Teredo is not working. And that basically means that your PNRP stuff is probably broke. But some interesting things here, you know, the network type is unmanaged. You may see that show up as managed. Typically you will have an error associated as well and you need to switch the mode of your TNR Teredo client to what's called enterprise client. Because usually that means you're sitting behind a firewall or on some, some kind of domain environment, something like that. You can also see what kind of NAT you're sitting behind. So here I'm sitting behind a restricted NAT. Earlier in the presentation I talked about symmetric NATs causing problems. To be really clear, that issue is when both clients are sitting behind symmetric NATs. If only one client is behind a symmetric NAT, um, in most cases that will not cause a problem. Um, it used to cause a problem in the earlier version of PNRP version 1, but I believe that's one of the things they fix going to version 2. Um, you'll also maybe see cone here or symmetric um, as the NAT that you're working with. So just some information that kind of get you on those initial steps of troubleshooting if you have it. So that's the end of the demo. Um, in the next screencast, again, we'll build a console application, a couple of them actually, to communicate in the same type of fashion um, using the PNRP API. So hopefully you've enjoyed this.